Fallout New Vegas. Chapter 5. Highway. That was Johnny Bond and his Red River Valley Boys with a little number called Stars of the Midnight Range. This is Radio New Vegas, and have I got news for you. I tried to measure my charisma on a vidomatic vigor tester once. The machine burst into flames. Just kidding, folks. I'll have some real news for you at the top of the hour, but right now I have more music for all my lovely listeners out there. In New Vegas, we know the pain that numbers can bring us. Well, so does Guy Mitchell, who's got heartaches by the number. For a long while, neither of us spoke. We just sat in my Corvega in silence, Eddie flying nearby and occasionally peeling off to take pot shots at rad scorpions. The ride this time around was a bit rougher than before, since I wasn't sticking to the road. I thought it would probably be a good idea to give Nipton a wide berth the second time around, so I was doing a bit of off-roading. It was times like this, I was glad I'd gotten the Corvega lifted and had the reinforced suspension put in during my last trip to Sacktown. To keep us on course, I was using my Pip-Boy's map function. Yeah, it was a bit awkward, holding my arm so I could use the steering wheel and see the map at the same time, but I managed. I can't speak for Cass, but I was silent because I was still fuming on the inside about what I'd seen at Nipton. I was trying to put it out of my mind. I had other, more important, more immediate things to do, like finding the man who shot me and left me for dead. I could actually do something about that. I couldn't do anything about the Legion, even if I wanted to. It was just too huge. It was an army, and I wasn't prepared to put my ass on the line for any causes right now, not unless that cause was my personal quest. Even so, what they had done to the people of Nipton, I just couldn't get the image of that boy nailed to a cross out of my head. I didn't even know his name. I never would, and it just got under my skin. So, Cass finally spoke up. Novak, huh? It took me a few seconds to even realize she was talking to me. Wait, what? Well, back at the outpost cantina, you said you were heading to Novak. She took a drink from her flask. Call me curious, but why? That's a whole lot of nothing out there, and it's an awful lot close to Legion territory. So what's in Novak? Do you really want to know? I asked her, my eyes locked on the horizon in front of me. Well, I did ask. I'm looking for the man who shot me. There was a very long pause. The man who shot you? Twice, in the head. I turned to look at her, pointing at the scar on my temple and the scar on my cheek. She was just staring back at me, a look of disbelief on her face. You got shot in the head, twice. She spoke slowly and her voice was flat, almost like she was having trouble processing this information. And you got better. I nodded, though, truth be told, if I hadn't lived it, I would probably have trouble believing it myself. I got patched up by this doctor in Good Springs, and even so, I was in a coma for about a week. Two shots in the head without an autodoc is still a whole hell of a lot of patching. I hope you thanked him properly, she said, chuckling weakly and taking another drink from her flask. I thought about it and remembered how Doc Mitchell had mentioned he'd gotten more than enough caps to cover the operation and care from Victor. So, who is this snake? Put bullets in your head. He have cause, or...? I was on my way to Vegas to deliver a package. He and a couple of thugs ambushed me, beat the shit out of me, took the package I was carrying and shot me in the head and buried me in a shallow grave. I woke up in Good Springs about a week later. Fuck, that's a hell of a story. She brought the flask to her mouth, but stopped just short of taking another drink. She shook her head. Man, robbing a courier. That's just low. I mean, I know some fucking ruthless bastards, but you don't fuck with the one who brings you your mail. I mean, that's like basic caravan code. You don't screw with your supply lines. Any family or group he's with is going to get a black eye for it, one way or another. I nodded, turning my attention back to the horizon. Eddie was zooming around the car, flying rings around it. If I didn't know better, I'd say it was showing off. Cass took another drink and continued. Hope this shithead knows what he's in for, from the both of us. That gave me pause. Both of us? Yep. Someone attacks one of us, they attack all of us. That's caravan code, and as far as I'm concerned, couriers apply as well. So you're damn right I'm gonna help you teach this fucker some manners. He got a name? You know, I didn't get the chance to ask, and he didn't introduce himself, I said, thinking. 
He wore a bad suit, though. Bad suit? Cass asked, finishing off her flask. She pulled a bottle of whiskey out of nowhere and started refilling it. What kind of bad suit? Black and white checkered jacket. Tacky as hell. She shrugged. Well, if assholes had taste, we'd all be feasted on shit. I started laughing. I couldn't help myself. That just cracked me up. She even joined in, and when the laughs finally died down, she continued. Still, a suit means money, and suits stand out, especially in the Mojave. Could be Vegas, but he could be at one of the larger towns around here, too. I nodded, agreeing. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. The last tip I got said he was heading to Novak, though. I'm not holding out hope that's where he is, but if nothing else, I'll find something there to show me where to go next. Don't you worry, she said, nodding. We'll sort this asshole out. Rattle his cage a little. I'm going to do more than rattle his cage, I said grimly. When I catch up to him, I'm putting two in his head as payment. See how he likes it. I hear you, she said. I get the chance, he'll get a couple of rounds of buckshot in his ass. Works for me. We'll call it interest, I said with a grin. She nodded and took yet another drink from her flask. At that, I couldn't stay silent about the drinking any longer. Okay, I gotta ask, how are you not dead? What? She looked confused. Well, that is whiskey you're drinking, right? Damn right it is. Whiskey's my drink of choice, she beamed proudly. Is it now? Well... She paused, looking thoughtful. Not sure if I chose it or it chose me. Dad ran a bar a long time ago. It was a labor of love, Mom said. Didn't really sound like it made her happy. Still, I'm guessing I got some of Dad's love of whiskey in me, because the burn suits me just fine. As if to punctuate the thought, she took another drink from her flask, letting out a long, satisfied sigh when she finished. People used to call me Whiskey Rose back west, before I punched enough people. So now they say it, but quiet when I'm not around. Whiskey Rose? I braced myself, fully expecting her to sock me in the shoulder, but she just continued. Yeah, on account of my name. And the blossoms on my cheeks when I drink too much. She laughed, a smile spreading across her face. That's why I don't even like being called Rose. Won most of those fights, too. Can take a hell of a punch and give it right back when I've got a bottle in me. See, it's all in how you drink it, you know. There's a trick to it. I'll show you how it's done if you want. She waved the half-full bottle of whiskey in my general direction. I declined, pushing it back towards her. Maybe when we get to Novak. Suits me fine. Though I don't think they even have a bar in that town. You don't need a bar to drink, do you? Judging by how much she'd already drank in my car, I already knew the answer. Not really, but I gotta buy the whiskey somewhere, right? There's usually a bar in every stop along the road, though. Helps me sleep. Well, not really, but it's what I keep telling myself. Sometimes I have to brew it myself, if I'm too far from a bar, or I've run out. Not quality, but I'm for anything that takes the edge off the day. Wait, you can make moonshine? I asked. My pit boy beeped at me. It informed me that we were getting close to Highway 95. Well, yeah, what else are you going to do with an empty bottle? Wait for it to refill itself? Fair point, I said, shrugging. Tell you what, you get me some ingredients, an empty bottle, a little time, and I'll keep us stocked. All right, sounds good. What do you need? Some maize, a couple nut fruits, a little yeast. She took a drink from her flask and continued. And a fission battery. What? You heard me, she said with a smirk. I don't actually put it in the brew before you ask. You hook up that nuclear battery to the bottle just right, it'll ferment the yeast in a few minutes like you've been distilling the batch for six months. Uh-huh. Your dad teach you that trick? Pfft, she snorted. Nah, only thing I ever got from him was this. I glanced at her, and she held up the diamond-shaped pendant around her neck. You know, I've never seen a pendant like that before. What is it? Gift from my old man, like I said. Gave it to me when he gave me my name, Rose of Sharon Cassidy. Mom said he got the name out of some old world book about dirt pilgrims or something. Sounds sweet, I guess, but I prefer my last name, Cassidy. Anyway, Pendant's a little rose. I originally thought it was one of Mom's tribal necklaces, but when I asked her, she said no, came from my old man. Wait, tribal necklace? You know, like one of the tribes from the east? We got him out west, too. NCR's herding him up, though, domesticating him. Mom was from east of the Colorado, not sure what tribe. It was before the time Caesar started rounding him up and made him legion. She walked a hell of a way till she crossed paths with my dad, and he convinced her to stop walking. And lucky for me, he was a horny old bastard. Uh... I didn't quite know what to say to that. That's one way to put it. Did you know him at all? 
She shrugged. Not really. He ended up walking east one day when I was young and never came back. Mom died waiting for him, and she had me to raise. She was sick more often than not, but held off dying until I was old enough to be getting in trouble with boys. As for Dad, I figure he just got himself lost or dead. It happens. I'm not all boo-hoo about it, so save your glass for someone who's crying. Any idea why he went east? Not a clue. When he left, I was too in my crib to understand why, and around the time Mom passed, I was too into my teens to listen. Got his name, got this pendant, and that's about it. So what about you? What about me? I asked, confused. Well, hell, here I am going on about my folks and my past and all that happy horse shit. What about you? You got family somewheres? I don't know, I said honestly. Never met him. She was silent for a long while. You've never met your parents? She asked. I shook my head. Nope, I don't even know where I was born. I grew up on the back of a Brahmin caravan that went all over the place. California, Nevada, Oregon, Washington. You name a place west of the Rockies, I've probably been there growing up. You ever ask about your parents? Of course I did, I said, pausing as the car violently jerked one final time before driving back onto the relatively smooth tarmac of Highway 95. But by the time I was old enough to think about asking, there weren't that many of the original caravanners left. Some had died, sure, but most had just joined other caravans. And the ones who were around, well, they all had different stories about where I was from. And a lot of the stories just didn't seem to match up with one another. Eventually, I just gave up wondering. I figured that if I wasn't supposed to find out, I wasn't gonna find out. Like you said, it happens. So, why'd you become a courier? Seemed like the thing to do, I guess. I tried settling down, once I was old enough to leave the caravan and strike out on my own. Got myself a place in Shady Sands, tried my hand at a couple odd jobs here and there, and got myself in a fair bit of trouble, too. But staying in that one place for so long, maybe it was because I grew up always on the move, but staying still just drove me buggy. That was... I trailed off, trying to remember how long it had been. Twelve? Thirteen years ago? Maybe? Either way, I started moving and I haven't really stopped since. Sounds like me. My feet get antsy if I stay in one place too long, like the outpost. It was driving me crazy, and that feeling of being trapped there. But with my caravan gone, who knows when I would have left. So, thanks for that. But don't mention it. So, how'd you get started in the caravan business, anyway? Started? Took to it like a fish to water. She paused, considering her choice of words. That is, if you know what a fish is. I know what a fish is. Do you know what a fish is? I asked with a smirk. Well, she faltered, but tried to cover it by taking a drink. Of course I do. It's this slimy, scaled thing, like a lake lurk, except no legs or claws. Most times, that is. They're like birds, except they stay underwater, you know? I did my best to keep a straight face while she continued. Anyway, I've seen pictures. One guy even had one above his bar in Reading, except it was made of pre-war plastic. He used to say it could sing, but I figured he was on a jet rush. When she said that, I couldn't help but laugh. What? What's so funny? You know, I think I've been to that bar. What was it, the Marmite Saloon or the Malamute Saloon or something? Yeah, that's it, the Malamute Saloon. The way I heard it, place was a whorehouse like 40 years ago till the NCR rolled in. Good drinks, though, even if it was a bit pricey. I laughed at that, nodding. The car fell silent for a few minutes. So, what do you think of the NCR, anyway? I asked. It was a stretch, sure, but I was just trying to keep up the conversation, get my mind off the Legion. NCR is my country and I support it. Anyone who says otherwise, I'll feed him my knee. I know which side of the firing line I'm on in the Mojave, just so you know. There's a butt in there, isn't there? Yeah, she said, nodding. There is. NCR is my country, but I'm not some blind, flag-saluting, do-as-they-will NCR lover. They're family. And let me tell you what family means to me. The NCR is like a brother, like some dumbass younger brother who knocked up the pastor's daughter, can't hold a job, and is home away as a fucking jail cell. Their compass is spinning all the time. I thought about that for a minute. Even though I never had a brother, that kind of made sense in a weird sort of way. So, what are you saying? They lack direction? She nodded and continued. It's been like that for a long while ever since Tandy died, but Kimball's been the worst. He tries to put the NCR's stake in everything he sees. Nobody's dick is that long. Not even Long Dick Johnson, and he had a fucking long dick. Thus, the name. Uh, yeah, I got that. Thanks. So Kimball tries to hold on to everything. He can't, because it's too big for the NCR to get their arms around. Can't guard the roads, can't put a line of troops through the Mojave. 
It's just greed that makes Kimball even try. And everyone suffers for it. Aside from the people in the towns, it's the soldiers suffer the most. Ever seen NCR troops asked to go after gangs at three to one odds? Yeah, I have. Pretty recent, too, down at Prim. That bear flag doesn't make them bulletproof, she said. And when those gangs were caused by the NCR in the first place, like the powder gangers, Caesar on a crutch don't even get me fucking started there. So, what's the alternative? I asked, shrugging. Look, don't get me wrong. I wouldn't want the Brotherhood or the followers or the Vegas families running the Mojave. All of them are a different kind of fuck-up. NCR just has some shaping up to do. Maybe Caesar kicking him in the nuts is a nice wake-up call is all I'm saying. I just wish Caesar would kick the heads off the NCR, not the feet. I've fucked a soldier in my time. They don't need to get fucked by their orders. After seeing what they did to Nipton, I wouldn't even wish Legion on the man who shot me. I thought about that for a minute, then added, Maybe. Yeah, it's kind of like the major downside to that whole idea. I mean, Mojave's suffering now. Imagine what it'd be like with Legion everywhere. I'm trying not to. I don't trade caps or supply anyone who keeps slaves and treats women like Brahmin in those camps of theirs. She trailed off for a moment, and horrible images flooded into my head. Unlike Nipton, I'd never really heard much about Caesar's Legion, except that it was this big army of slaves across the Colorado, a nebulous force of evil and spookiness that I always thought was just NCR propaganda. Now I was starting to wonder just how many of those stories I'd heard were true. But there are some caravans that deal with them. I didn't think Legion dealt with any caravans at all, I said, thinking about some of the anti-Legion posters in the outpost. Yeah, they're out there. And as much as it pains me to say it, any caravan marked by Legion is safe as houses. They guard their roads, their supply lines. Even fiends think twice for going after any trader with a red bull flag. If Kimball took the same stand and made sure NCR committed patrols to the roads, then I think that'd solve a lot of their problems right there. But he doesn't, so they don't. Caravans get butchered in the Mojave all the time, like mine. And so fucking close to Vegas, you could see it from the wall. Sounds to me like it's not so much Kimball, but the NCR as a whole. Eh, NCR tries, I guess, she said with a shrug, taking another sip from her flask. It's just that trying don't mean a good goddamn when you're paying your respects to the dead. And Legion, from what I've heard, they don't do the stop tolls on the roads or in the outposts like the NCR quartermasters do. You're lucky if you turn a profit. Sometimes, if a new officer gets assigned a route, fees just get worse. I'd much rather take the fees than get put on a cross, I said. Or burned on a pile of tires. Or have my head cut off. Know what I want? I want Kimball to make good on his campaign promises and get NCR to protect the roads like Legion does. Much as I hate the Legion, and trust me, I'd bet you any money I hate the Legion as much as you, caravan life would be a hell of a lot easier as long as those companies were run by men. And that's the biggest issue I see. It's a shame, but I think there's people in the NCR who feel more strongly about this than I do, and I feel pretty fucking strong about it. What do you mean? Some caravans deal with Legion now because of the security they provide. If towns could get the same protection, a lot more tempting than you'd think. A bunch of people would be willing to side with the Legion to not have to worry about fiends or boomers or great con attacks. It's not hard for some folks to sell freedom when the alternative is worse. Especially if being with NCR is going to get you on a Legion cross, I said, finishing her thought. She nodded, grimly. It's like, no matter what we do, we're going to get fucked. Legion will crucify your ass and NCR will tax it out from under you, and then the Legion will put you on a cross anyway for your trouble. Only if you stay in the Mojave, I said, trying to steer the subject away from the Legion. It was just making me madder. Something tells me you and I aren't really the type to stick around here if things go pear-shaped. That's true. You said you've traveled a lot. So have I. Passed through places enough times people sometimes pay me more caps to take something to the next town. That's kind of how my caravan got started. One day, it occurred to me I could scratch the traveling itch and get paid for it. Cassidy caravans just sort of formed around me. So, how is the caravan life here? She shrugged. Up till my caravan got burned... I liked it. I'm not one for soft living, or soft men, let me tell you. Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking to you right now, on both counts. It took me a minute to parse what she'd just said. Miss Cassidy, are you flirting with me? I said, a wry grin on my face, half-joking. I had no idea what grinning was doing to the scar on my cheek. For the first time, I was kind of glad I hadn't shaved in a few days, since it probably hid the scars. Somewhat. 
She laughed, and then hit me really hard in the shoulder. Don't you be taking that as anything more than words. I know your look. Met a dozen guys with that same look in their eyes. You probably say all the right things and leave a trail of broken hearts behind you. Just so we're clear, nothing, and I do mean nothing, is ever going to happen between us. You'd best respect that. My point before? You know the wasteland, and it's a hard place where only the strong survive. You know, that's probably going to bruise, I said, looking at my shoulder. Serves you right, you lech. Good hit, though. No, it wasn't. This is a good hit. Whack! Novak was a little community that had sprung up in the remains of a small, two-story pre-war motel at the intersection of Highway 95 and Highway 165. What the motel used to be called, nobody remembered. The letters on the sign had all fallen away or rusted into nothing. The only thing left was what the townsfolk had taken for the name, the only five remaining letters of the No Vacancy sign. The most prominent feature of the motel was not the sign, or the shanty town on the west side of the 95, or the abandoned gas station nearby. The most prominent feature of the town was the dinosaur. I think it was supposed to be a T-Rex or something. I'd seen something similar, years ago, at the radioactive labor tar pits in the boneyard. It wasn't quite as big as the NCR monument at the outpost, but it was still the first thing we saw as we approached in the Corvega. As we got closer, I could see that bits of its green scales were flaking off, revealing the metal framework underneath. It wasn't quite night yet when I parked the car at the gas station, but it wasn't quite day either. The sun was just starting to set, and the sky was turning all shades of orange and purples and reds and blues. Eddie buzzed around the car, a soft and happy sort of tune made out of random beeps and whirs coming from his speaker. So, Cass said to me, getting out of the car, What's the plan? Well, I said, checking the time on my Pip-Boy. I figure we can get a room and stay the night, and then I'll start asking people in the morning if they've seen a guy in an awful suit. We? she asked, raising an eyebrow and staring at me, ice water in her gaze. Did I say we? I said, as tonelessly as I could muster, despite my shoulder suddenly and inexplicably flaring up. I meant you. You'll get the room. I'll stay in the car. I'm just giving you shit. You know that, right? Cass said with a smirk. Still, I was probably going to stay in the car anyway. Force of habit, you know, I said, shrugging. At that precise moment, something oddly familiar caught my ears. I perked my head up, trying to listen. Before I realized what was happening, a familiar squeaking sound, like a greased axle grinding along metal, sounded from behind me, followed swiftly by an all-too-familiar mechanical cowboy voice. Well, butter my butt and call me a biscuit if it ain't my old friend from Good Springs, I heard Victor say to me. I turned around to see him roll to a stop a few feet away from me. Hello, Victor, I said, eyeing the robot with suspicion. His screen flickered slightly as he wobbled in place. You know this bot? Cass called out from behind me. Yeah, I said, turning to her. This is Victor. He's the one that dug me out of that shallow grave. Victor, this is Cass. Howdy, ma'am, Victor said to Cass, making a motion that would have been like tipping his hat if he'd actually had a hat on his head, which he didn't. Uh, hi there, she said, waving weakly. She shot me a look that practically said, what the fuck is going on, without actually saying anything. So, Vic, tell me, what are you doing all the way out here in Novak? This is quite a ways from Good Springs. The robot screen flickered again. Don't rightly know. I just got the notion to make my way up to New Vegas. Reckon I'll find out when I get there. Quite the coincidence, us meeting up like this. I didn't believe in coincidences, so I was trying to probe the robot for any answers I might be able to get. From seeing how this is the only road around, I'd be a sight more surprised if we didn't run into each other from time to time. You said the men that jumped me were heading this way, right? It was a long shot, I know, but I thought maybe that would trip him up and get him to reveal something. No, don't believe I did, Victor said slowly, his screen flashing violently before shifting back into focus. You might ask around, the Novak folk usually see anyone traveling this way. Hmm. I knew something was off, but I couldn't figure out what. And talking with Victor, that was like talking to a very stubborn brick wall, made out of titanium. Well, I guess I'll see you around then, Vic. Be seeing you, Victor said. 
He turned around and rolled away before coming to rest at the Novak sign. Eddie floated in the air beside me. He looked at Victor, then at me, then back at Victor, and then finally back at me, where he started beeping and buzzing something that sounded slightly obscene. You know, Eddie, I really wish I could understand you. Cass walked around the car, looking over at Victor as she approached. So what the fuck was that about? I don't know, I said, but I have a nasty feeling I'm going to find out soon enough.